This episode is sponsored by Repos Production. Episode 37 of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. (laughs) I'm your host, Candace Harris, and today I am so excited to be here with one of the people who create them, Antoine Balza, who's probably most well-known for designing Seven Wonders, Takenoko, Takedo, Ghost Stories, and Hanabi. So many bangers. How's it going today, Antoine? Hi, Candice. Uh, I'm great, thank you. I'm still waiting for the spring because it's cold uh, where I am, but uh, I'm okay. I'm staying inside and playing board games. Awesome, awesome. That sounds good. <laughs> what is new with you? Uh, it's been a big week for me. Uh, I started a new company, a publishing company with uh, Thomas Provo, which was the co-founder of Repo Production, which oh. is a big uh, publisher here in Europe. Yeah. And we cool. just released our first game uh, in, on the French market for now, but it will it will be uh, in uh, all countries uh, hopefully in <laughs> in, a, in a few days. Cool. So it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a first time for for me doing uh, publishing. You know, yeah. I used to I used to design, but not to publish. So uh, our first game is called Captain Flip. And it's a game from two Italian designers, uh, Paolo Mori, maybe you can, you, yeah. <laughs> you know him. Oh, yeah. And a Love friend Paolo. of his, which is uh, Remo Consadori. So we just published it uh, maybe uh, three days ago. So it's still uh, very exciting to see the, you know, the first review here in France on the games. Cool. That is that is so awesome. And I, yeah, that must be quite a leap, like kind of going from, you know, designing a bunch of games all these years to now jumping in the publishing pool. Yeah, it's not the, the same job, the same job for sure. A <laughs> uh, lot of new skills, you know, to learn, meeting people and uh, yeah, very interesting, but a lot of work, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, what else have you been working on lately? Well, I'm still designing some games, but uh, less than before because the publishing job is taking a lot of my time, but mm-hmm. I, I've just finished a big, project with uh, Bruno Catala, which I cannot really talk to you about, but it should be released at the end of the year and uh, the publisher will uh, end up the, you know, the communication and the press release. So it's still secret, but I think it's, it's, uh, it will be awesome for, for, for the fall. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I'm excited about that already. Wow. That's super cool. Um, well, today we are going to discuss some of our favorite roll and write games. And personally, like I'm not the biggest fan of roll and writes, but like I think part of my excitement for doing this episode with you is well, you picked the topic number one. So yes. you, I'm assuming you like roll and writes. And I'm always trying to find like some gems, you know, like I'm like, which one haven't I tried that maybe I will really like and that'll. You know, I don't dislike them. I just never like I I'm not just someone that's super excited about yeah, them okay. when someone's like, let's break out a roll and write. But like even just like thinking about games for this list, I was like, okay. There are a few that I do enjoy quite a bit. It would be interesting because I really love the those roll and write games. You know, I love simple and fast games, so it's perfect for me. Yeah, yeah. Well that yeah, that totally makes sense then. <laughs> But uh, before we start talking about roll and write games that we enjoy, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, Anton. So let's jump into Fresh Plays. So I'm currently playing uh, Maya Island from designer uh, Ryan Arknesia. Uh, and I play, I play it with my son and my wife, and we used to play the uh, the other game from the, from the same series like uh, My City and My City Roll and Ride because there is a, a <laughs> Roll and Ride here. Right, and, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's fun. You know, it's 
it's not very ambitious, but it's a solid design. It's it's like the, the the other one, but with some some new twist, and it's it's the kind of, the, the kind of game I like playing uh, on the evening with my family because it's it's light, so we can discuss uh, about maybe other topics while playing, and it's very cool. enjoyable. So so it's a legacy game. So we we start we started to play it, and we are going to play the for a few few nights uh, in the in the next days, and. Uh, I love the legacy, uh, you know, the le- legacy playing experience with the fam- with the families. It's very, it's very nice because we get back to the to the same adventure together. It's, yeah. it's, it's a really a nice bonding moment, you know. I, I like that a lot. That that's awesome. Yeah, I've actually never played my city I or my island yet, but I've heard just like really good things about them, and that does sound like r- like a really nice family bonding experience to play something like this that's like light where you can chit chat but you're also kind of going through a long-term adventure together and remind me is this competitive or is it a cooperative game Uh, it's it's competitive yeah okay (laughs) and i'm losing almost uh, every game but uh yeah it's it's definitely competitive (laughs) awesome awesome so that is my island so recently i have played for the first time and now at this point i've played it twice a game called tyrants of the underdark it's not a new game it was originally released in 2016 and i have the 2021 edition because i love deck building and so at some point i was looking at every trying to play every deck building game that anybody was saying was like hey i I really like this deck building game and i remember it was out of print, but then they put out this new 2021 edition. I bought it and whenever I bought it as soon as it was available for pre-order and it's been like sitting in my garage forever. At some point I move it to the shelf and I'm like, okay, I'm going to play it at some point, but I finally made it happen recently and uh, I love it, but spoiler alert, but it's a deck building area control game with a Dungeons and Dragons theme, which I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, so the theme doesn't really matter too much to me. (laughs) But it's published by Gale Force 9, and it's designed by Peter Lee, Rodney Thompson, and Andrew Veen. And Peter and Rodney, I found out, also designed Lords of Waterdeep, which is this like very classic worker placement game that's really good, actually. I played that for the first time last year, and I was, you know, I'd heard oh, people always talk about Lords of Waterdeep, how it's a great like first worker placement game. But it's it's definitely one that, you know, similar to Tyrants of the Underdark that kind of withstands the test of time, you know, where it's still it's still I consider them both to be bangers. But it's it's basically this like like very like the, it's almost like the complexity weight of Clank, like a light deck building game with action happening on the game board. But for me, I find the action, I mean, I like war games and stuff, so, and I love area control, so I love the action that's happening on the game board. You're basically competing over different territories, trying to uh, score points from having control of them, and, you know, hopefully you'll have total control, meaning you have all of your little, little troop pieces there in a different, like, territory, or I think they're called sites, But you're going to be just, everybody starts with a basic deck of cards. You're going to add better cards to them that are going to kind of shape your strategy throughout the game. And one of the things I was liking is that everybody can kind of pursue different strategies in this game. Like there's a way, you know, in deck building games, usually you want to cull cull your, your deck so you get rid of those like weak starter cards. Well, in this game, in order to do that, you have to buy cards that give you this ability called promote. And it's like you're promoting these minions to be in your like inner circle. And then when they're in your inner circle, they score you more points at the end of the game, which is uh, really cool. It's like a nice twist on culling and it makes that decision of, hey, do I just get rid of one of my weak cards to, you know, just get it out of my deck? Or do I promote something that's better and it's going to be like a lot more victory points at the end of the game? So there are lots of like cool decision points. Um you have some like neutral troop characters on the board. Everybody starts from different home sites and you're kind of making a path to move into different territories to take them over. So there's lots of really cool player interaction and tension. And then you also have these spy tokens you can put out. Like, so if you buy cards that let you play spies, 
put spies out, it lets you kind of spawn from different points in the game. And the other cool thing that I like about it is each game you play with two half decks of cards. So it the new version, I think, comes with the expansion. So there are six different half decks. So you can kind of mix and match them and change up the the mechanism slightly in each game and the, the feel of each game. And again, it, it only it only plays in like 90 minutes and it's like not that complex. Like if you played any deck building, you can teach this really fast. And I everyone who played it with me the first time had played Clank and we're like, oh, this kind of feels like Clank, but different, you know. <laughs> so I it it is my jam. I'm so glad I finally played this. Have you ever played Tyrants of the Underdark or are you a deck building fan at all? Uh, no, I didn't play it, but you make me want to play it because I'm playing uh, <laughs> DND. I uh, oh. really love Clunk. Oh, so, so yes. Yeah, I will look into it for sure. Yeah, I would say definitely, definitely check it out if you're a fan of Clank and if you like the DD, you know, theme. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it has a very like kind of dated look because it's from 2016 and they didn't. I mean, the art on the cards is really good, but it's just like the game board and kind of the backs of the cards. I know they wanted to kind of keep it consistent with the original version. Yeah, but I think it's just a really smooth game and I'm it's staying on my shelf. Love that it can be played in like 90 minutes and it's a quick teach, especially if anybody's already played deck building games. Uh, so yeah, that's Tyrants of the Underdark. What else have you been playing lately? So I just played today at lunch break at work. Uh, oh, wow, the, really fresh. Yeah, so it's very, <laughs> very fresh. <laughs> so it's the White Castle, which is uh, was which was on a French version, Le Chateau Blanc <laughs> in Ooh. French, uh, which was released at Essen last year, I think. Yeah, I think so. And it's from designers... Uh, Isra C and Shay S. I don't know how you, yeah. how you pronounce it in English, but I just know those Red names Cathedral. from Red Cathedral. Also, they they made the yes. Red Cathedral. Yeah, and I, I I played the Red Cathedral. I wasn't really fond of it, but uh, my first game of White Castle was a uh, really good uh, t- today. So basically, it's a worker placement, but the worker are dice. Mm. So you roll dice and you pick dice and you place them at, as, as worker on the board. And you have uh, multiple ways of scoring points. Uh, you can do with uh, warriors, with uh, um, a noble and uh, I think gardeners. I think it's the third type. And uh, which is the thing it's, that is very interesting for me. It's, it's very short. You play three rounds and, and each round you play only three actions. So you pick nine nine total for all the games so it's very very compact and very fast and it was a bit you know a bit surprising uh, during the first game but uh, but I, I want to to play it again to see how how it feels with a uh, with more play because it was very very short but still very enjoyable cool how many players did you play with uh, we played uh, four players so it's the max uh, oh, max wow. player I think okay. it's one to, to four. And even with four players, it was like maybe half an hour, <laughs> plus the room, of course, but maybe you just, so it was really, really quick. Yeah, yeah so I, I played White Castle, uh, I think in December when I was at PAX Unplugged, and I played it with just two players, <laughs> and I was like blown away with how fast it was too. Yeah. It's one that I I want to revisit at some point with more players to see. Um, I really appreciate the, like, Number one, how kind of small that box is for what yeah, you're getting. Small, yeah, yeah like full, full of gorgeous components, everything yes. in wood and everything in a very, very sort of compact box. Yeah, really, really nice production. So when I initially played the Red Cathedral, I loved it because I think, again, in a similar fashion, like that game played, you know, it wasn't 30 minutes, but it was like an hour and 20 minutes or something. And I'm like, oh, this is like a cool, like medium weight game that has some like really interesting mechanisms for something that can be played in this short window of time. And I played it twice, like within a week. And then I kind of lost interest in it a little bit, or I still think it's like a really cool game, but I was just like, okay, I don't need to own this one anymore. And like when I played the white castle, I was, I I thought it was good and I liked the production of it, but, um, I'll have 
have to revisit it at some point with more players. But that's cool because I feel like there are a lot of people who are really, really digging this one. Yeah. And and uh, as it's very short, you can you, you can play a few, a few games. It's not yeah. it's not a big deal too. Yeah, that's awesome. Then you're like, I just played this at lunch today. <laughs> so cool. So that is the White Castle. The other game that I've been just playing, I've played a couple times now at this point. Um, that I'm finding very very interesting. It's called Dinosaur Gauge. And it's a 2022 release uh, designed by Mary Holland and Amabel Holland. And this is a Hollenspiel game. And this is actually the first game that Mary is one of the Hollenspiel uh, founders. And this is her first design. And so it's it's really super cool. And every time I play a Hollenspiel game, I go in with the idea of like, this is going to, something's probably going to be a little weird about this, but weird in a good way to me. And this is a three to five player game, which they describe as a pick up and devour game because I have dinosaur gauge, you know, but you're basically everybody is investing in four different kinds of dino industries. So this game, you know, when you look at it, you'll get like a cube rails kind of feel to it, but it has like a little bit more going on and it's a pick up and deliver kind of mixed with a cube rails thing. And they're just a couple of funky twists because there are four different types of stocks you can get in the game. So everyone's going to start, and this kind of depends on player count, but you'll start with one share of one of the dinosaur uh, rail companies, which there are four of them. And then uh, there are, you'll probably have one or two other shares, depending. I've only played this with three and four players. I haven't tried it with five yet. But you'll have some other shares. And the other shares you can get, like there's a there are three different shipping companies. Cause in the middle of the board, picture a map with hexes. In the middle, there's a big lake or some kind of body of water. And the timer for the game is that each turn you're gonna put a tile, a land tile, onto one of the water spaces. So you're kind of closing off these water spaces as the game progresses. I think there are about four different types of terrain, maybe three. If uh, like they're clear hexes, mountain, swamp, and water, I think. But you're going to basically be trying to invest in different shares of these different types of industries and hopefully make the most money at the end of the game. But the the structure of the game is very simple. Like each turn, you get a little bit of income. You get five bucks. You can, uh, you, you place a tile. So again, everybody's always going to place a tile and close off this water. But there's like some strategy and there's some interaction which comes with that because you can like block things off from people or make people think about things differently depending on which tile you pull and where you place it. Um, and then you're going to take, you, know, you, think you, buy, you can buy a stock. So you can buy one of the available stocks and again, one of these four industries and then you take an action and the actions are printed on the board and they're really straightforward. Like you can build tracks. So, or just build, and that's putting cubes out of a rail company or extending a rail company. Um, and then you, you have this, one of the industries is this, uh, these shipping lines. So in the water, there's, there are, there's an A line, a B line, a C line, or there could be multiple lines, but basically any land spaces that are kind of connected to these shipping lines, you are considered adjacent to the other side of that. So that's a way when you're like building out cubes that you can get on the other side and start spreading, you know, in a different direction and everything. But every time you use one of those shipping lines to build, you have to spend one of the cubes that you were, you know, going to potentially be able to place out. And that's increasing the value of the shipping lines. So if I'm using the A shipping route, I put a cube there. And so they pay out at the end of the game. Everything pays out at the end of the game differently. But then you have these factories on the board. You start with a T factory and a U factory. They all have dinosaur names. And um, they'll start with two random goods. So there are like three goods on, on the in this game. And we call them Kool-Aid because there's like red. So we're like cherry Kool-Aid, grape Kool-Aid, and orange Kool-Aid. But you have these col three different color goods, which you're going to be trying to deliver to different cities. So one of the actions is 
deliver a good. So if you're connected to that good and you have a path to a city, you deliver it. And the way it pays out is based on how many of the goods are off of the like goods track. So in the beginning of the game, the, every stop you hit is $5 and then you add that and divide it by the shares and pay out and everything. So there's like, there's like stock market stuff like, like train game stock market stuff like that. But if you are one of the people who has stock in one of the factories, you can produce goods at the factory. So as people deliver them, they come off the board and we want new goods to come so we can keep making deliveries. But you can only do the produce action if you have stock in a particular factory, you'll refill all of those factories on the board. And like more factories come out as people uh, become shareholders in factories or they are part of the random tiles that come out, like new factories can come out. So you're thinking about where does it make sense to place this? And you get paid out if you're a shareholder when you produce goods. Um, then eventually, like the goods after they're delivered, they're in this waste area. So one of the actions is you can recycle them and get money for putting them back into the economy so they can be produced again. And then the last type of industry is like you have these airlines. And at the beginning, these airlines are not open. So you have to connect to them and then you get a stock in them. And what we learned in our last game is these airlines can, if you do it well, can pay out big at the end of the game. So it's just like this really cool game that has like a lot of interaction. I love that there are four different things you can choose to invest in. It's shared incentive. So, you know, if you and I are both have shares in the red dino company, you know, mm -hmm. we're both going to be talking to each other about, hey, how should we build out? What should we be thinking about? So there's a lot of like fun like player interaction at the table, good table talk. Um, it doesn't take that long to play. And yeah, it's just like a game that every time I play it, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to play that again. I want to show it to more people. So, and I think there is another map for this game coming out uh, sometime this year in 2024. But so it's, um, a, it's a big game. It sounds like a, a long game there. Uh, it, it's... So in terms of size, it's 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 no bigger than like something like a, a Railways to the World map, like maybe a medium sized okay. map in that kind of game. Or I don't know if you've ever seen Dual Gauge before. It's kind of like similar to a lot of uh, train game, like Cube Rail kind of game maps. Okay. And yeah, it, it doesn't. It's just there's a timer because every time you're getting your money putting a tile out and taking an action. And I love that all the actions are on the board. Like the player aid is on the board and it's just like, it's pretty quick to get people into it. And they're just, they're a couple, again, all these industries score differently at the end. Like, Oh, Oh my gosh. I almost forgot to bring up one of the most important things about this game. Instead of a stock market, there's a stomp market. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a real fun mechanism because when you move, like not only does it have dinosaur paws along this track, but as you deliver goods and you're increasing the value of each uh, company, train company, if you ever increase enough to exactly land on the same price as another company, you stomp it and it moves back one space. So there is like really, really, I can't believe I almost forgot to mention that, but there's really, really fun stock market like manipulation with timing that sometimes trying to make that stomp happen and lower the value of somebody's uh, company in to increase yours. So that's another like little neat, neat twist to this game. But yeah, it's, it's not, it's not like that big of a game. It's not I, I would say plan for an hour and a half, maybe two hours of people are taking, you know, a long time to like think about things, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Do you, do you ever get into any of the, like the cube rail games, like Irish no. cage or. No, never. So it's the first time I heard about this game, but it's got dinosaurs. So I, I who doesn't love dinosaurs? So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's just a fun, <laughs> it's a fun theme. Yeah, and, and I yeah I don't know how many people. I mean, I think there's like Holland Spiel probably has a 
fan base of people who are always like buying any Holland Spiel game mm. that, that comes out. But otherwise, it's kind of an indie company that not many people maybe have tried this yet. But uh, so far, it's been a big success with, you know, the eight different people that I've played it with. So and like some of these people are like, again, like me who have played it and we're like, let's play it again. Well, you know, let's yeah. play it again. So, yeah, so that's Dinosaur Gauge. Definitely worth checking out. Let's get into our Roll and Write chat, shall we? And now a word from our sponsor. Confess, you're hooked on Seven Wonders Architects too, right? Are you racking up game after game at home and on Board Game Arena? Have you turned friends, family, and even the board game of Verse into fans of this accessible version of Seven Wonders? Well, it's time to level up your experience with the new expansion from Antoine Bauza, Seven Wonders Architects Medals. This expansion spices up your gaming sessions with shared objectives among players that will bring a fun twist to your matches. With Seven Wonders Architects Medals, building a wonder is just the beginning. You'll need to achieve specific objectives to gain medals before your neighbors to earn victory points. And with the new Expert variant and new wonders, the Colosseum of Rome and the Ziggurat of Ur, brace yourselves for twists and turns that add a new dimension to decision-making and competition. Don't miss this historic moment. It's time to unleash your strategic prowess and make your mark in the era of great construction. On your mark, get set, build. Seven Wonders Architects Medals is available now. So we're both going to like kind of talk about some of the Roll and Write games that we enjoy most, some of our favorites. But first, I know there are some people who might not even know what a Roll and Write game is or what they're all about. So, I don't know, do you want to give your thoughts on it first, Antoine? Yeah, sure. Uh, usually you roll a bunch of dice and you have a piece of paper and uh, each player has to grab a pen and depending on the dice, uh, you have to make marks on your on your paper. So, basically, it's like Yahtzee. Everybody maybe know Yahtzee. So, it's all those right. games are sons, sons of uh, Yahtzee, basically. So... You roll dice, you have a piece of paper, and you you try to make uh, to make points by uh, crossing uh, squares or any shapes uh, yeah. depending on the, on the game. Yeah, and they're they're typically very like small and portable games. Like usually, you can play them with a lot of different players often because it's like a lot of them are kind of simultaneous. Like one person will roll dice, and then everybody is then writing on their sheets. So. Usually you can play a lot of these with a lot of um, different players at once. They don't take long. Yeah. Um, they're usually just like, just like you explained with <laughs> explaining what they're all about. They're pretty simple for the most part. You usually can play them solo. They make good solo games because they're kind of puzzly often. But there are like a, a, a lot of heavier Roland Wright's coming out, like, you know, like Twilight Inscription. I have yeah. not tried it. I love Twilight <laughs> Imperium, but like, yeah, you know. This one, yeah. Yeah, that, this, that one kind of breaks the normal rules of, hey, this is a short, small game because it's like that one is bigger. I think it takes about two hours to play. So it's a different kind of experience. You know, I like I like to bring one to the restaurant when you are waiting for your order. So <laughs> a small yeah. one, but maybe not toilet inscription. No. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, every time it's not time to play it at the restaurant, but I like yeah. to I, I travel a lot, so usually I like to pack one or two in my in my luggage because usually the rules are very simple, so you can explain it to uh, people who are no use to play a lot of board game board games. So it's yeah, yeah I really like, like them. Yeah, and you're you're kind of selling me on these even more because that is like a great point of how it's something like really easy to just travel with, break it out on the airplane, uh, break it out on a train, or when you're waiting for your meal to come out at a restaurant, yeah, sure. it's a nice, fun activity. So that's why I'm kind of, now I'm going to be on the lookout for what is my, you <laughs> know, new next favorite Roll and Write game. And then there are like, there've been some innovations on this genre, you know, like we have flip and write games and that's, yeah. that's a very popular thing too. I think I'm trying to think of, I think I might've played welcome Two before I even 
played an actual Roland right before. I think oh, I might have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of wild that it turned out like that. But like flipping right, it just kind of instead of rolling dice, you have a deck of cards usually and you flip a card over and then you mark something down on your sheet. And then have you played Next Station London yet? Yeah, I, I really like Next Station London. I think it was uh, nominated for a few awards uh, last year. Yeah. So it's, yeah, so it's a really strong design. Uh, it's Matthew Dunstan, I think. Yeah. Alone? Yeah. I'm not sure. It's Matthew I don't, Dunstan. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. But yeah, that one I thought was pretty neat because you have like, you're doing root building, but you have four different colored pencils. Yes. And like... You know, after round one, you pass the pencils around. So maybe round one, I'm writing with green. Round two, yeah. I'm writing a root with purple. And, you know, you're trying to score things. But I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. Each color is one of your subway lines. So, yes, the theme is working great with the mechanism, which, uh, which I like. And, yeah, it's a really solid design. Have you now, have you ever played Hadrian's Wall? No, I didn't play this one. Okay, that's I another. Heard, I, I think it would be considered a flip and right, if I recall, because you have you have a deck yeah. of cards, but that's like a heavier kind of bigger game okay. uh, that I enjoyed. I enjoyed, but it wasn't after I played it. I wasn't like, oh, I can't wait to play this again. But I thought it was fun when I played it. But anyway, let's let's jump into our list, shall we? Sure. Mine aren't in a particular order where number one is my favorite per se. But I think it's one of my favorites. I think it's one that I don't know that a, a lot of people know when I bring it up. And so I kind of ordered them, I think, from the first one that I played to okay. the one that I think about most, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? I, so my, my list, my order is a little random is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think mine's too. So I wasn't sure if I have to, to hold yeah, them. Yeah, no, no, my, no. My, my I don't, don't want to so force just, people into a okay. top five or anything like that. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll start with you. So the first game is uh, Roar Through the Edges from designer Matt Leacock, uh, which was released in 2008. And I think he wow. was nominated for Spiel des Jahres in 2010. Wow. Uh, and maybe it was the first release game from Matt Leacock. I'm not sure, but one of the his first and uh, directly nominated for Spiel des Jahres, which was very, very good stuff very for impressive. him. Very <laughs> impressive. And, 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 and we know he did, uh, he did a lot of good design after this one. So. Yeah. And um, I think this, this one is really interesting because he had a lot of, uh, wood component so it's dice rolling you have uh, a sheet of paper to <laughs> to to make marks but also a wooden board with some markers to uh, keep score of your resources oh. because you have to it's a it's a light civilization game so you have to uh, take resources uh, you can build wonders will give you points and uh, you have to avoid disa disasters because on the dice there is one bad, you know, bad side of the dice with, with um, to um, which triggers disaster for you or for the opponent. And uh, I think the he aged a bit because he was not a simultaneous uh, play. You have to to play turn by turn, and, uh, gotcha. and it's a bit. If you play four player, it's a bit long for for now, but. Yeah, it, it was before the Roland was were cool. It was already there, you know. So yeah. it's, a, it's a, really, a really strong design. And that was Roll Through the Ages. Yeah, Roll yeah. Through the ages. I've heard of that. And then when you said two thousand eight, I was like, wow. Yeah, I didn't even realize people were making these games back then. Wow. I think you know if if you if we don't talk about the Etsy and everything, it was the the first of the the this new wave of a world and world and world game, yeah. Very very cool. So and yeah, I have to try that at some point. I do like Civ Builders, so so the first game on my list is I think the first Roll and Write that I played. I think it is the first Roll and Write that I played. Um, and it is Ganchan Clever, or uh, That's Pretty Clever is the English translation. And it came out 2018, uh, designed by Wolfgang Warsh, published by Schmidt Spiel. And then there was another version by Stronghold Games. And now there's, a, I think, a third English edition from CMYK that's out this year. 
This can play be played with one to four players. In the game, you'll have a score sheet that has these five different colored like scoring areas that kind of work work differently. And um, there's this concept of active player turns and passive turns. So if you're the active player, you're going to roll six dice. And the dice are, there's a white die, but then there are five dice that are corresponding to the colors of matching the different scoring areas. So during the game, you'll be able to make up to, or during your turn, you'll be able to make up to three rolls. And each time you're going to take a die. So if if you're the active player, you'll end up taking three dice on your turn. But each time you take a die, all of the other dice that you rolled that are lower valued, you have to put on this silver tray and your opponents are going to get to mark something on their sheet based on that. And it's also kind of limiting your options for when you do one of your rerolls. So when you're picking your dice, you're, uh, you're often not picking the highest number because then you're you're giving your your opponents a lot more options. But like the different scoring areas are really cool. Um, like one is you always have to put a certain number, you know, a particular number or something that's greater than a number or you know you have to like kind of meet these requirements. But the cool thing is there are so many combo opportunities like, oh, I mark this one box on the yellow scoring section. And because I completed this row, now I get a blue number that I can fill in. Oh, and then I fill in the blue number and it lets me do this, which gave me an orange number. And I've, yeah, so you could do all this like these scoring chains, which is like really, really satisfying. And I've just I pro- I might have played this game the most out of any of the games that I'm going to bring up. And I just, I really liked it. And I I eventually got the second one. And I think there's a third one out maybe, or maybe there's like a deluxe version. Like they just kind of keep expanding (laughs) on this one. But yeah, it's called That's Pretty Clever. I enjoyed it a lot. And yeah, I just think those combos are satisfying. Have you gotten into that one? Uh, I I played this one a few times ago, but... Uh, it's it's weird because I'm not fond of the, of the chain of scoring you were talking about. Yeah, because it's like it's like a bit messy and chaotic for me. So it's it's not in my list, which is good. <laughs> we can talk yeah, about this yeah. for and right. But yeah, I played it, and I'm 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 fond. I think uh, you the designer, which is a uh, Volgan Varsh, is a really brilliant designer with a lot of very very good games. And he can make, you know, heavy games and just small yeah. and very clever roll and world games, which is uh, really impressive. Yeah. Yep. So that's 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 pretty clever. <laughs> What's the next game on your list, Anton? So the next one is maybe my still my all time favorite and one of the first. It's Quicks uh, from designer Stefan Bendorf. Okay, uh, never played it. Oh, you never played. Oh, I've you never have to play it. it. <laughs> and I, I think we. Uh, if uh, if if you don't count the uh, roll through the edges from Matt Leacock, I think Quicks was the first who opened the the fashion about uh, roll and write. You know, gotcha. Uh, he was released in two o twelve, and he was nominated for uh, Speed SRS the same year as Hanabi was uh, nominated, and oh. that's where I uh, I played it with the designer at, oh, the, cool. at the at the ceremony, and I I think it's. The, I'm a really a million seller or everything because it's still uh, selling a, a lot and it's very very simple. You can play. I think it's two to four player, maybe five. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. You have four dice, uh, two white and uh, four of different colors, and the active player uh, throw the dice and then you have a little sheet of paper with four rows, one of each of the color of the dice, and you have to uh, you have to make just crosses, you know. Yep. But you have to go on the two first line. You have to go from the small numbers to the highest numbers. And on the two other rows, you have to go to start with the higher numbers. So you take two dice. So it's 12 is the, the best. And you have to go down. And it's really, really clever because you, you are allowed to, uh, you know, miss some, some uh, spots. You can, uh, you can uh, go along the row, but you don't want, you want to make as much as a uh, mark you can, you can do on a row. So it's, 
very simple and very very clever and yeah it, it was the first without quicks we we did we won't have those those uh, roll and write everywhere so today cool. so it's a really good game uh, quicks it's q w i x X two time, I think. Okay, I, I've seen it's, it before, yeah, but I've just never tried it. I'll, I'll have to try it. Yeah, it's it's uh, very very small. You just have a, a, a bunch of papers and uh, and uh, six dice in the box, so it's a very you can you can bring it everywhere. So maybe I played more than one hundred times, I think. Wow. Okay. And I I still use it, you know, to introduce uh, introduce board games to players who are not used to to play because. Yeah, it's similar to Yahtzee, but you will see it's, there is a twist and a very clever oh. one. So usually it's, a, it's just doing a great job for people who are not used to, to play games. Yeah. Awesome. I will, I will check that out. Yeah, I'll check that out. And yeah, the more, the more we talk about these, the more I'm like, yeah, I'm going to figure out one of these to like be my travel game now. <laughs> oh. Uh, so the next game on my list is the game, I the Roller Wright game, I think that I've played the most recently. And it is called House of Cats. I want to say, I think it was, I think it just came out last year at Essen in 2023. And this is designed by William Atia, who's the designer of Kalis, oh. and uh, Christian Amundsen Ospi, who designed Revive and Escape the Curse of the Temple. And I think Santa Maria, one of the designers of Santa Maria. And it's published by Aporta Games plays with one to six players. Uh, we played this game with, I think, like 10 people <laughs> around the table. So, you know, it's it's one of those that if you have pencils, I think you can really play with more people. But um, you have in this game four different sheets. I mean, like many roll and writes these days have like different boards you can kind of play on. But you have different house sheets that have different rules to them. I only played the very first one, so I don't know how the other ones work, but I like that there are other ones, you know, to give, give you some variety. Um, so at the start of the game, you are going to randomly pick four ability tiles, and the game comes with like 10 or 12 of these different abilities, and someone is going to kind of arrange them from top to bottom, and then everyone is going to draw the ability into their boxes on their sheets in the same order, top to bottom. Because what you're going to be trying to do in this game, besides just have the most points, is you're going to be trying to complete rooms as you're filling in your sheet. And as you complete different size rooms, like there's a two room, a three room, a four room, and a five room. So each ability is going to be associated with when you complete a room, you unlock this ability. And then Whenever you want, you can kind of trigger the ability. Or some of them are like one-time immediate effects. Some of them are trigger them whenever you want to. But um, one person is going to roll four dice. And the dice are custom where you have a two, three, four, five as numbers on the dice. But then one side is a mouse and one side is a cat also. So you'll roll these four dice. Doesn't matter who does it. And they'll... You know, and then every player has to simultaneously pick three of those dice to draw on their player sheet. Now, again, I only played the first map, and if you pick a cat, there's a special cat track that's like separate from the house, and you just kind of mark it off and you get cool stuff as you go up this track, and it's worth victory points. But with the two, three, four, five, and mouse icons, whichever three dice you pick, when you write them on your sheet, like this grid of an outline of a house, you have to draw them adjacent to each other, so orthogonally adjacent. So if I pick two threes and a mouse, I have to make sure when I draw them on my sheet that they're adjacent to each other. And you're filling these things in to hopefully, again, unlock these rooms. And the way you unlock a room is by making groupings of the same number. So if I have two twos next to each other, orthogonally adjacent, I can say, oh, I completed a two room. I draw around those two twos, that grouping, because I can only group things once. And then I have unlocked that ability or I do that immediate effect. If I have three threes grouped next to each other, I unlock the, you know, the ability of the th three room. Five fives, you know, 
that's that's pretty much how it works. On the first board, when you draw a mouse in, the column, the top of the column, and the 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 row that you're touching, you get to unlock cheese, <laughs> and mm. cheese is worth a certain point. But I just found this game to be kind of fun. I love that you have these different ability tiles that you play with and that you, that'll come out in different orders. And so, you know, you'll have a mix of abilities you can unlock throughout the game. And the fact that you're limited, restricted to placing whatever you write adjacent to each other, it's very puzzly as you're trying to say, okay, I want to try to make sure I have a good set of fives in this area so maybe this turn i take the five the the cheese and the cat or whatever you know like it i felt like there was like some really good puzzly decisions and where you unlock these abilities and you can figure out when you want to cross it off and like use it to do something else cool again combos that's a, a thing that's very common with rolling rights but yeah this was a game that i kind of I thought about after I played it, I was like, I think I would buy this and I, w- I want to kind of play it more. And I also thought it'd be a good gift for a lot of people because I know a lot of cat lovers. Yeah, but, sure. yeah, but I, I I think it's I haven't been able to find a copy of it. So maybe it's it'll be more available later this year because it just came out at Essen. Um, and also, I was like really surprised to find out that it was like the d- designer of Kalis. You know? Yeah, sure. I, I didn't know he was still designing game. In fact, yeah. so <laughs> right, right, yeah. So um, I'm I'm presuming that you haven't tried this one yet. No, okay. <laughs> first time I heard of it. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem like many people have heard of this one yet, but it might be right up your alley. <laughs> yeah, sure. I love cats, so. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I know so, the and, and cats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this one is called House of Cats. What is your next game on your list? So my next one is called Super Skill Pinball for Cade. <laughs> so wait, let me pause you right there for a second, Antoine. Because I'm just like scrolling down my list. I have this as my next game oh, also. Interesting. <laughs> Uh, That's so funny that we synced up on the game and where it is on our list. But I'll let yeah, you kick it off. I, I think it's not the, the, the most famous of uh, Roll and Ride, so it's interesting. But I'm a, <laughs> I am love pinball, so I love yeah. Roll and Ride and pinball. So when it came out, I just, you know, I bought it right on the spot. And uh, and it's it's a nice game. So it was the first box, because I think there are maybe two or yeah. three Did- at yeah, there, I, there's I'm like sure. there's one called like Ramp It Up that added new pinball machines, and then there's a Star Trek one. Yeah, too. I know there I've, is a Star Trek. Yeah, I've only I tried do. the first the first one. Yeah, me, me too. Which uh, already have I think four different pinball in the first box. Yes. I think if I remember well. Uh, so it's it's a game for I don't know how you pronounce it. Jeff Engelstein. Yep. Jeff Engelstein. And, uh, yeah. I think which is uh, the thing which is very interesting. It's I think is doing a really good job as emulating pinball, which was yeah. which was not so, such easy to do. So it's very interesting because you are playing on the on the. It's it's not a paper sheet. It's a, I don't know what you call it. It's yeah, like a dry board. erase board. Yes, like they're actually like board. boards. Yeah. And and of course you roll dice and you have to to cross section to to score points, but you also have to. To put and move a small uh, pinball, yeah. which is half half of a ball, so it doesn't roll on your on your on your sheet. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting because all the things you love about pinball are in the game, like bumpers and uh, and targets and everything. Spinners and, different... and the flippers. Yeah. yeah, I think it's 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 a yeah, it's a really really interesting design. The the downside is, I I think it's a bit long for. Uh, mm. For, for those kind of games. So usually we just play two balls and not three balls, which uh, I think the, the designer wants to keep the three balls of the pinball, but I right. think it's long. <laughs> so we only play it with uh, two, two balls. And of course you can activate multi-ball, which is very interesting. So you yeah. add, you add new, new half balls on your board and <laughs> trying to make a lot of points. So it's very original and very, uh, yeah, very interesting uh, roll and write, yeah. Yeah, and and the yeah, so the the theme hooked me in because it's just like pinball. That's so like such a fun 
theme and I and the art and the components, like you're saying, the fact that you have this half ball that you're moving around on your board and you're marking stuff to activate different things. And then you can even like, uh, you know, you bump the table a little bit. Like there's a mechanism yeah, for like it. nudging in the game. And yeah, so there's a, in the base game or the original game, there are four yeah. different tables. There's one, the, the intro one, and they kind of vary in complexity and different things that are happening, which is really cool. There's a carnival one, like a cyberpunk one, a fantasy theme, like yeah. there's something with a dragon. And then there's a disco one. And yeah, this game is just super cool. I haven't played it for a while either, but it definitely like made a, a mark with me. Like, And it's a game where one player will roll two dice and then everybody uses one of those dice to mark on their sheet. So everybody's playing the same pinball table and yep. using one of the two dice, but you're kind of making your own choices and everything kind of uh, works out differently. But I'm very impressed with how thematic this is for a roll and write. And again, like the art and components. Like I remember thinking, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. Like they can expand on this so much. And they did, yeah, sure. like, even though I haven't <laughs> played the other boxes, but there are like four different uh, tables, I think in the ramp it up version. And then there's like for Star Trek fans, like there's a whole Star Trek version of it. And you can keep doing it because there's so many different types of pinball machines. And that's people who are like real pinball fanatics, like love getting, you know, all these different like, oh, this is from this movie or this is from this band. And uh, yeah, I think this is a super, super cool game, very unique theme. And uh, I'm still just kind of cracking up that we both put this for our, ne <laughs> our next game. <laughs> a super skill pinball 4K. <laughs> All right. So let's see. I, I don't think we're going to match up going forward. But uh, what is your the game you have for your number two slot? And then I picked a uh, uh, Trek 12. Maybe you heard about it. Trek, Trek 12 from French designers uh, Corentin no. Lebrun and Bruno Catala. Uh, the publish, published by Lumberjack, French guys, or uh, French team, French okay. uh, designer, French publisher, and I think French illustrator too. So, uh, it's very interesting because you are, so you are, uh, trekking in the mountain. So, uh, it's a, it's a classic, uh, roll and rise. You only have two dice with number. I think it's not the same. One dice is one to six, and maybe the other is two to, Two to seven, or so it's not exact, but it's gotcha. two. It's it's, it's two, two dice, and every everybody has the same sheet. And the clever thing with the with this game is, uh, the active player roll the dice, but you have to you have to choose. The selection is very clever because you have to choose either the the highest die or the lowest, or you can add both die or subtract or multiply. Ooh. But you are allowed to do each of those operations only. I think it's four or five times a game. So if you use all your lowest dice oh. pick, then you have to finish the game with the other uh, operation. So, oh, so you, have to, you have a really, really in interesting uh, choices, and you have to you have to make uh, you know area of the same value, but also chain of of, of, of number like two, three, four, five, six, mm -hmm. and the, the longest is the chain. The, the more points you get. And the other, other aspect, very interesting, is it's a legacy game. So you start on your first track. Okay. And then you have, you know, envelope with, a, with new components and new, and new shit. So you are going up in the mountain and you're discovering the game as, uh, as you play. With the same team is better, but you're not, not, not mandatory to wow, do that. Wow, neat. So it's a roll and write legacy, uh, legacy game. And very, very clever one. So if you didn't play it, yeah, you have to find the, the copy. It's a really, really good one. Oh, and wow. Did, and what is it called again? Trek 12. Trek. Trek, just like in Star, Star Trek. Trek, like a trekking oh, in the Trek morning. 12. Trek, Trek 12. 12. Yeah. And 12 because the value are up to 12 when you, when you play. Cool. And the, the, so the first box was in uh, Himalaya, I think. And there, there was a second a spin, a spin off, a second box, which Amazonia. is in uh, Amazon, Amazonia, yes. So, and both, both are legacies with, di with different uh, aspects. 
I've and never the, heard of this. This is this sounds really cool, and I've yes. I don't I think this is the first time I'm hearing of a legacy roll and write game yes. too. Very neat. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna try this one. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's cool. So my next game is a game that I've only played once. Okay. At Essen in 2022. But I thought it was very cool and had a very unique theme. And this is a game called Vengeance Roll and Fight. It is. It came out in 2022. It's designed by David Turtsey, Nora Lee Libbers, and Gordon Kalea from Mighty Boards. And it plays with one to four players. And this is a competitive real-time roll and write game based on a board game called Vengeance that came out in 2018. And that was designed by Gordon Kalea. And the theme is basically like this Kill Bill style revenge action movie. So each player is going to have two boards. One of them is like your character and the other is a den, like where you're trying to like where the bad guys are hanging out and there's a boss that you're going to need to find and hopefully take down and everything. And each character has like a different, like all the characters are unique and each character has a weakness that they start with, but they'll also have their own set of items, like unique items that are associated with the character. And you'll be able to get these, uh, add these different abilities to kind of make your character unique. And the, the first phase of the game, so the game is each, each round, there are four rounds and there are four different phases that you play each round. There's a flashback phase where basically you have on your den board, you'll have a little character, a meeple, I think. And you're, you're flashing back to like training pretty much where you're like preparing for the fight that's about to go down. And in this flashback phase, there are three or four dice. I forget that you'll roll that everyone will be able to mark on their sheet based on these dice. They can kind of get experience. You can heal wounds. And so everybody's kind of doing that at the same time. And then you start with a number of these dice where they're like, this is the main type of dice that you're going to have. They have like this like run kind of icon on it. Like there's a gun, there's a knife. And I think one side has two knives and everybody starts with, I believe four of these dice but then there's a pool in the middle of the table of more of these dice. And once you start this phase, this is a like kind of a race to grab the dice and assign them. You're going to roll your four dice. You're going to assign them to different actions and weapons on your board. So I think like the move action, you need to have two running dice. So you know, you roll your dice. Oh, I have, you know, two running dice and two knives or whatever. And you say, okay, I'm going to assign them to this thing. And then the, whenever you have less than four dice, you're able to pull dice from that common pool. And that's going to be when that common pool runs out. I think that was the trigger for when this round ends. So you're trying to like quickly, and you can re-roll as much as you want. But if you re-roll this, like, I think it's a blood icon or something like that, you can't re-roll that die and... Unless you you could take it as a wound to reroll everything else or something like that, but it's just like this 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 crazy phase of like rolling these dice and assigning them to things on your board and on the bottom of your board, one of the things from that flashback phase you're unlocking these like experience points that you can spend to get upgraded things that you can assign dice to, and so it's like I love that that phase of assigning your dice is kind of like simulating an action movie. Like it's very fast paced. Everybody's doing it. It's a little chaotic. Um, but then you hit this fighting phase where now everybody is just looking at your own den and your own, you know, everything that you assigned. And now you're activating those things however you like to kind of move through this building and take out these different type of like henchmen and tough guys and you can collect loot and you're trying to complete different objectives that are going to give you points. And then you're trying to make your way to this like boss. And then you, you know, you get points for like damaging the boss. And then if you're able to take down the boss, you get points for that too. So everybody's kind of doing that on their own board simultaneously. 
And then there's like a cleanup phase and then you just kind of like do it again and you're trying to level up your character, heal your character, get better, cooler stuff. But then you're assigning these dice to actually be able to use the things that you're adding. And I just thought like the theme is very like unique for this game. I love that like rush to like lock in your dice to grab more dice before that pool runs out and try to like build up as much as you can before you go into that fighting phase. And this game comes as like there are two boxes like and you can I think you can get any of them or you get them both and you can mix and match or play with eight players. But it's uh, two episodes and each episode comes with like different heroes, different bosses. The dens are like double sided. So there's a lot of variability. But this one just kind of resonated with me because, again, as somebody who's not typically a fan of a big fan of roll and write games, I thought this was really different in terms of the theme and just like how and I thought it was very thematic how it feels and how you're like moving through these different boards and or these different rooms to take down people making decisions to try to complete these objectives or do I grab the loot with this and use these custom weapons yeah so this one is called vengeance roll and fight have you heard of this one no but I'm an action movies lover so I would check I would check it for sure oh this might be right up your alley then yeah (laughs) all right well I guess it's what we got one more to talk about Yes, and the last one for me is Quinto, and it's from the same publisher as Quix, and that's the same <laughs> label at the beginning. Okay, so it's okay. NSB, the publisher, but this one is designed by Bernard Lark and Uwe Rapp, and uh, it's uh, it's just like the same playing experience as Quix, as it's just a small box with the uh-huh. you know the playing sheets and only three dice. Uh, on the three oh. different colors, and uh, you only have uh, three uh, three lines on your on your sheet. And uh, when you are the active player, the twist is you can choose to roll one, two, or three dice, and then you have to uh, make the sum, and you have to mark the sum in one of the color of the dice you you roll. So oh. I think the color are orange, purple, and I'm not sure. Red, let's say red. Okay. If I choose red and purples, I roll those two. I have to make the sum, and I have to put the value in the red or the or purple the light, purple. but okay. not on the orange because I choose not to roll the orange. So there is this little uh, little choice uh, for the active player, which is really interesting. And then you have to complete rows uh, going to the lowest to the highest, and you have some uh, column bonuses. So you you have to match. The value you put to get uh, more points on the on the on the columns. So it's very simple and uh, like Quicks, since it's a descendant of Quicks, very very clever one. Small box, you can bring it everywhere. So uh, if I don't have oh. Quicks in my luggage, usually I have Quinto. Quinto, in the <laughs> one of two. So. And it, is this one a one where you will? I forget it. it you roll the dice. Like say, I, I'm the active player. I pick two dice. I roll them. Does everybody use yeah, those everybody dice? Yeah, everybody gets to, to, to put the, the value, but what the active player choose uh, choose the, the color and the number of dice. Yeah, gotcha. Everybody's playing at the same time. Uh, so it's still very dyna- dy- dynamic, and you play in maybe 10 minutes, and I really enjoy those very, very short uh, short games. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. Quinto. It's Quinto. And, <laughs> yeah, okay, follow-up to Quicks. Cool. But it's a, it's a different designer? Not the same designer, but the same publisher. So it's it's yeah, it's a it's a line with a, f- a few rolling uh, rolling white game. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I st- I'll I'll probably try out Quicks first, the the original. <laughs> or yeah, the sure. OG you should, the should try Quicks first, but both are, are are really really great. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So the last game on my list is a game that I think I played for the first time in 2020 at a Gamma Trade Show. Eric Martin showed this to me. And at the time, we uh, only had the German version, which is called Man Moss Ock Gonen Konen. And later there's an English version, and it's titled Divi Dice. So this was a game that Eric showed me at Gamma and I immediately was like, how do I get a copy? I might've had to import it. Cause I don't know if it was available in the States, 
but it's designed by Ulrich Bloom and Jans Merkel. And again, it came out in 2020. It's from Schmidt Spiele. And there was later an English edition by Stronghold Games. And it plays with one to four players. And this is a game where you're going to be trying to complete a three by three get grid of these cards. And each player will start with these three, picture these square cards. They come in, they'll have a different color background. I think there are four different colors, like yellow, pink, blue, and green or something. And you'll start with three cards in, to s- make your starting tableau. And you can position those three cards however you want. Uh, they all just have to be orthogonally touching. And during the game, these cards are dry erase friendly. So they're kind of laminated. So you'll be drawing on these cards to kind of complete whatever the task is on the card to either activate a bonus ability or some kind of scoring condition. So yeah, there are two types of cards. Again, some that are going to give you end game scoring options and the others are going to give you bonus abilities where you can like, if I unlock, if I fill in this card, I'm going to now be able to modify dice three times or something like that, you know, Mm. or I'm going to be able to change um, the color of a card in my tableau or something like that. I don't remember exactly all of the the abilities, but there is a market of cards, almost like a deck building game or something, where you'll have four cards that are these endgame scoring cards available, and then there are also going to be four that are bonus abilities. So when it's your turn, you'll roll dice, and you can keep any you like, and you you are sometimes forced to re-roll, but... Regardless, if you re-roll, everyone else gets to then mark something on their sheet. Mm, okay. So then if you have to re-roll a second time, again, everyone else will get to mark something on their sheet. So it's like you're it's a game where you're trying to avoid re-rolling, re-roll. but sometimes yeah. yeah, sometimes you like can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the cool thing is is you again you have this market of cards because you're trying to get more cards to fill out your three by three grid. And you need to have, I think, the same three of a kind, like three matching numbers, and you can and there are two slots in the market where you can buy cards that you spend three matching dice. And then there are other cards to the left of the market where you have to spend four matching dice. So you're making decisions of like, hey, do I want to use dice to complete one of my cards that's already in my tableau, like fill in numbers? And there are all sorts of things like some of them require a certain number. Sometimes it's a certain number and a certain color. Because, yeah, I think they're color dice in this game, too. Some of them, um, you know, so it's like it's it's good to complete cards because if they're completed, they'll score at the end of the game or they'll give you that special ability. But you also are like, well, or do I want to spend these three dice to just cash them in and get another card for my tableau? And that'll also, you know, you're balancing that because when the other players, when everyone else's turn, if they have to reroll, you get to fill stuff in. So if you've already just have a tableau of everything's already filled in, you're going to miss out on opportunities. So there's like this balance of when to get more cards versus when to complete cards so that I have uh, cool abilities. And the the scoring cards are like things like, hey, if you have for each row that you have of all pink cards, get 10 points or whatever Mm -hmm. for each, you know, row or column. Or sometimes it's like, hey, if you've just completed, like finished, uh, you know, activated four cards orthogonally or something, you know, like around this card, you score points. So it's it's all about like positioning your cards well, which color cards you're getting and stuff like that. But yeah, I just always thought it was pretty neat because you have that choice of, you know, instead of a game where you just have a sheet, everybody has the same sheet, you're kind of building your sheet and you can mix and match having cards that give you abilities versus cards that are going to score you points. And also the game box for this, you know, it's a small game box, like similar size to probably a lot of roll and rights, but the game box is a dice tray. And I think, is it like, yeah, I think you put the dice that you're putting on it. I don't know. It was just like a clever production of how the game is packaged too. But yeah, this one has always kind of, uh, 
I've been I've been a fan of it since I first played it. I you know I've introduced everybody I've played it with. They end up liking it a lot. I ended up giving it away to someone at some point who wasn't like a you know a big gamer, but he really you know liked it and needed something lighter for his collection and just loves it. So and I I again I don't I feel like I don't hear many people talking about this one, but I thought it had some neat things going on. Uh, so yeah, that's divvy dice. Yeah, D- D- DV. <laughs> yeah, like you're divvying up the dice. D i v v y. Yeah. Yeah, v v y. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you might like this one because yeah, there's just some things that are a little different about it, but I quite liked it. I still at some point probably want to try Twilight Inscription because I like heavier games. I like Twilight mm. Imperium. And I have heard good things about it. I just haven't gotten around to trying it yet. And then two other games I just want to quickly shout out that I want to play just based on um, hearing from some people that like really like them. And they also sound a little different. One is, have you ever played Fleet the Dice game? Flip the Dice? Fleet. No. Fleet. A like fleet? a pirate. Yeah, F-L-E-E-T. Okay. Oh, it's it's uh it's from a, a bigger game, no? It's a, a, I, a think so. I, I think I, I played it, yeah. I yeah. think it's uh, it, Fleet is a it's a big uh, resource management game, and they and they did a roll and write. I think I, I played it once, but it was yeah. a long time. Ago. It, it's something kind of like piratey themed, where you're fishing or something. And I've just heard a lot of people, especially solo, like really really like Fleet the dice game. So I'm curious to try that. And then the other one that I wanted to, that I heard about that sounded really fun. Have you ever heard of long shot, the dice game? Nope. It's like a horse racing betting game. That's a roll and write. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. So those are just like other ones that I want to try. And, and that Trek 12 that you mentioned, that that sounds yeah. that looks really cool, sounds really cool. And I I've never tried Quick, so I I want to try that. So this was <laughs> this was exactly what I was hoping to get out of this episode is just like some other games to try and also like I I you know, when you start thinking about at first I'm like, "Oh, everybody's doing roll and rights, so many roll and rights." But it is kind of cool from a design perspective how many different ideas are kind of coming from this core yeah, idea just, of roll some dice, yeah. roll some, uh, write some things down. Yeah, th- that was just my thought, you know, uh, all the variety of, of different games you have just based on, okay, somebody's going to roll some, a bunch right. of dice with, <laughs> with a mark on paper. So it's, yeah, it's very interesting, uh, I think. Yeah, so maybe this will this will give me a new spark to get back into roll and writes. <laughs> and also, like, I definitely invite, like, I always post a blog on uh, BGG with each podcast episode. So I'd love to hear from more people of other games that, you know, we should check out because I I had a feeling there were some gems out there that I hadn't tried yet. Sure, sure. And I'm not going to give up on roll and write games. You know, maybe a year from now I'll be like, oh, they're my favorites, you yeah, know? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, Anton, it was so great talking to you today. I'm and I'm again, yeah. yeah, I'm glad that you picked this topic and, you know, just so that I could kind of explore some of these games more and like we could just talk about like what makes them interesting and what yeah. makes them like the fact the portability and just break one of these out at the you know when you're out to dinner and waiting for your food that's that's so awesome yeah i don't like to wait you know so <laughs> <laughs> keep your mind occupied right yeah, for sure yeah <laughs> cool well thanks again for joining me and you know, hopefully I'll actually get to meet you in person at some point and maybe yeah, Essen or one of these conventions. My pleasure, for sure. You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at boardgamegeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at boardgame.com.